Okay, great. Wait. Hold Hi, on. everyone. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Um. Okay, now. Great. Hi, everyone. Um, we're so sorry about the delay getting started this morning. We were having some technical problems going live. So thank you all for your patience. We really appreciate it. Um, so today we have the pleasure of hosting Dr. Avi Varma, who specializes in family medicine. Um, as always, please remember that the Google form will be posted in the comments at the end of the live stream. So whenever you're ready, Dr. Varma, you can get started. Thank you so much. And thank you guys for having me. Um, so I'll go ahead and get started here. So yes, um, my name is Avi Varma. And um, basically I'm a board certified family medicine physician. I attended the American University of Antigua School of Medicine, which is located in the Caribbean. Um, I then went on to complete my family medicine residency training at Mount Carmel Health System, which is in Columbus, Ohio. And after I graduated from residency, I moved with my family to um, the west side of Michigan. And I became an outpatient primary care physician and worked for a large hospital-based healthcare system. After that, my family and I moved to Atlanta, Georgia about a year and a half ago. And I started working for a nonprofit organization. And at my current job, I uh, provide patients with HIV and AIDS with um, care for their HIV and AIDS, as well as providing primary care services. Um, on the side, I am also doing my MPH currently at the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health. And um, I do that on a part-time online basis. So just wanted to give a little introduction about myself. In terms of disclosures, I have no financial disclosures and I have, well, nothing that I discussed during this presentation is uh, representative of my employer. Um, I'll be presenting a couple of clinical case presentations, which are based on real life experiences, but there's no information about specific patients in my presentation. So I wanted to start by talking about what family medicine is. And this is a very long quote, but it actually describes family medicine very well. Um, it's a quote from the American Academy of Family Physicians that I got. Um, and it says that family practice is comprehensive medical care with particular emphasis on the family unit in which the physician's continuing responsibility for health care is limited neither by the patient's age or sex, nor by a particular organ system or disease entity. Family practice is a specialty in breadth, which builds upon a core of knowledge derived from other disciplines, drawing most heavily on internal medicine, pediatrics, obstetrics and gynecology, surgery and psychiatry, and which establishes a cohesive unit combining the behavioral sciences with the traditional biological and clinical sciences. The core of knowledge encompassed by the discipline of family practice prepares the family physician for a unique role in patient management, problem solving, counseling, and as a personal physician who coordinates total healthcare delivery. So I know it's very long, but I really like this quote. I think it really describes family medicine, which used to be called family practice and sometimes still is by some people. So in my own words, basically family medicine provides comprehensive and continuing medical care to all age groups from newborn babies to the geriatric population. You can see all ages. You can limit your practice if you decide that you don't wanna see all ages, but that you would prefer a specific age group. So you can do things kind of either way. Um, in family medicine, you do provide preventive care services. So you educate your patients on different disease processes. Um, you can perform certain uh, cancer screenings, um, which I will discuss later. And you wanna make sure that your patients are up to date on their immunizations. Um, you'd provide chronic disease management or chronic care management for conditions like diabetes and hypertension, which is high blood pressure. You can also perform minor in-office procedures such as incision and drainages for abscesses or skin infections skin biopsies for moles that may look concerning or abnormal, and even joint injections uh, for patients that have arthritis and joint pains. These are just a few of the different procedures that you can perform. 
In addition, you'd manage specialty referrals such as cardiology, pulmonology, and gastroenterology. Basically, you will be the home base and family medicine is the home base for a patient's healthcare needs. So what are some job opportunities for family medicine physicians? Let me see if I can get this out of the way. Um, so there's several, and I've listed a few of them here. So outpatient medicine, which is what I practice. There's inpatient medicine, um, which would be more of a hospitalist position where generally um, physicians work seven days on and then seven days they have off and they alternate the schedule. Uh, you can work in urgent care settings, which I have done actually in the past as well. And you can also join an academic program and become a teaching faculty member, training other residents and future physicians. You can also go into fellowship and actually specialize into a different field. So I'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. Um, in terms of different settings that you can work in, you can work for a large healthcare organization or system, which I've done in the past. You can work for a smaller community hospital. You can work in a rural setting at a rural hospital. And you can also work in private practice. You can start your own practice. Or you can even work in nonprofit, which is, um, as I've said earlier, that is what I do. So what fellowship opportunities are available? So if you want to see the full list, you can actually go to the aafp.org website. Um, but here are some of the ones that you can specialize into. There's addiction medicine, adolescent medicine, emergency medicine, geriatrics, hospice and palliative care, integrative medicine, obstetrics, sports medicine, and women's health. Here are some of the questions that I commonly get asked about family medicine. So I just wanted to go ahead and share these with you and what my answers are for each of these questions. So why did you choose family medicine? So for me, family medicine is truly about um, the variety and the diversity that it brings. Um, you know, I get bored with seeing just one type of disease process. I enjoy seeing a variety. And I feel that it's a field in which you're constantly learning. And I love that. I love gaining more knowledge, learning about new conditions. Um, and so I feel that family medicine really keeps me on my toes. Um, and I really, really enjoy the diversity in the ages of patients that I see. The other thing I really like about it is it's truly about family. It's about seeing that family unit that I talked about earlier. Um, you don't just see the parents, you see the kids, you see the grandparents. I mean, you can see a whole family essentially and really build lifelong relationships with your patients if that's something that you're interested in doing. Um, it's about really getting to know your patients on a personal level, but also keeping things on a per, uh, professional level as well. Um, so the second question I often get asked is, what is the difference between family medicine and internal medicine? So I um, kind of touched on it a little bit when I described what family medicine is, but basically in internal medicine, the patients that you see are 18 and older. Um, with family medicine, you have that opportunity to see younger patients. You can see them, you know, once they're born in the hospital and they come, they can come to you as a newborn. So you can really start care from the earliest age and you don't have to stop seeing them at the age of 18 where they usually transition to a different physician. You can continue to provide them with care throughout their lives. Another question I commonly get asked is specific to the residency training. So how long is residency training for family medicine? And generally speaking, it is three years. That's traditionally, it's traditionally a three-year program. Um, in some cases, it can be longer. So there are some programs that are four years, but most of them tend to be three-year programs. And I attended a three-year program. So what does an average day in the life of a family physician look like? So for me, being an outpatient primary care physician, I see patients, generally speaking, Monday through Friday. My schedule is pretty traditional, eight to five. So if you're looking for kind of an eight to five job in medicine, you know, family medicine definitely would provide you with that option. Typically what happens is you get one half day a week for administrative purposes. So, you know, uh, catching up on patient charting notes, um, 
contacting patients, uh, refilling medications, reviewing labs and orders, things of that nature is what you would be doing during that administrative time. And then the rest of the time, like I said, you'd be seeing patients. Um, so that's generally what things look like for me right now during the pandemic. Things are just a little bit different where I do a mix of telehealth and in-person visits. So we still offer in-clinic appointments because we have to with our patient population. Um, now, the final question I often get asked is, do you have a work-life balance as a family medicine physician? And the answer is yes, absolutely. You can make your career what you want it to be, I feel like, with family medicine. Um, I kind of talked about the different options as a family medicine doctor. So you have different options to choose from into what you want to do. Um, I worked in the corporate um, world for a few years and realized it really wasn't for me. Um, and so I transitioned to the nonprofit world and it's really been uh, fulfilling for me and it has helped me to balance work and life. So it's definitely something that is achievable in this field. So I just wanna stop real quick and see if there's any questions that you may have I'm just going to see if I can pull the chat. I don't have the chat box open again. OK, so nothing is of yet. So we can kind of keep going. So I'm going to get into the case presentations now um, and feel free. Oh, I do see a question here. Is residency training for internal medicine three years as well, or is it a bit longer? So traditionally speaking, internal medicine is also three years. Um, again, there are some programs that are um, four-year programs, so that applies to internal medicine as well. But for the most part, yes, they're going to be three years. Another question here, um, is it common for you to see multiple people from the same family at the same time? So we try to avoid that as much as possible, but in instances where it's a mother, or a father coming in for an appointment and you know it's more convenient for them to bring their kids as well, we'll tend to make some exceptions here and there. Now that's gonna vary from physician to physician and how they wanna practice because you know obviously there are certain things, it's a little bit hard to do a full visit on a parent when you have a very young child in the room. So, I mean, it does vary. So, um, but yes, there are times where you can see multiple people. I've had instances with an older couple where they were comfortable being seen together and preferred that. And, you know, I've, I've done that too and happy to do that. So definitely, you know, I, I try to offer flexibility for my patients. Another question here, can you talk more about your experience with med school in the Caribbean? Yeah, so um, my, the program that I attended um, is actually called American University of Antigua. And they offered a twinning program that was based in India. So I actually did my first two years in India where I went through the basic sciences and you had the same education in Antigua um, as in the India program, but I had just chosen to go there. Um, and I actually bypassed the island altogether and ended up coming straight to the US uh, for my clinical rotations. And during rotations, so it's pretty standard and comparative to US medical schools where you do your basic sciences in the first two years. So mostly, you know, lectures and your exams and everything for the different classes like you would do in college as well. So what that would include in terms of class topics, you know, anatomy, physiology, biochemistry, are kind of the big three for your first year of medical school. And then traditionally your second year of medical school would be um, pathology, um, pharmacology, microbiology. So those would be kind of the classes you would take then. Um, and then during clinical rotations, um, basically um, I had the opportunity to travel around the US and do my rotations in different cities and different hospital settings. So for me, it was actually a really nice time because you know, I enjoy traveling, so I got to experience that. But not just that, I actually learned a lot from the different um, hospital settings that I worked in. Um, you know, I worked in different communities in different cities, different size hospitals. So really got to appreciate the diversity um, in the patients that I took care of. Any other questions before I move on? I think that's it. All right, so I'm gonna keep going here. Um, next, I'm gonna be talking through some clinical case presentations for you guys.
Okay, so the first case, I'm gonna read through this um, and I'll stop after each case. So if you have any questions, feel free to add them um, to the chat box. So Mr. A is a 57 year old African-American male who presents to the clinic with excessive urination, excessive thirst and excessive hunger. He complains of feeling tired all the time and has had numbness and tingling sensations in his feet. So his past medical history includes hypertension, which is high blood pressure, and hyperlipidemia, which is high cholesterol. He has no known past surgical history, social history, current smoker. He has a 20 pack year history of smoking. Um, sexual history, he's married in a monogamous relationship with his wife. Family history, he, um, he in both of his parents, they've, uh, both his parents have diabetes, mellitus type two, hypertension and hyperlipidemia. In terms of allergies, he has no known medication allergies. And in terms of current medications that he's taking, they include lisinopril, which is a blood pressure medication, and atorvastatin, which is a cholesterol lowering medication. So a couple things to know when you're um, doing clinical cases or you know, um, when you're seeing patients, um, it's important to get a full history. One of the nice things about medicine or how I view medicine is almost like you're a detective and you're trying to piece a puzzle together. So you're trying to solve this mystery. What is going on with the patient? Um, even when you're taking an exam, you're gonna highlight important points in whatever you're reading and decide you know, what's going on from there. So um, in this situation, a couple things I'm pointing out are the symptoms that he's experiencing. Um, he has family history that's interesting to note. He's a smoker and he has some other conditions that are really important in this case, including the blood pressure. Okay, okay. so moving on, um, looking at his vitals um, and I've bolded things that really stood out in the patient's exam. And just note, this is not a complete exam. Um, I've put certain points down, but I have not, this is not what my full note would generally look like. Um, there would be more to it. And you'll see uh, site varieties or variations in the cases that I show in terms of the exam. Vital signs show that his blood pressure is 140 over 90, which is borderline high. His heart rate 70, respiratory rate is 14, temperature is 98.6 and oxygen levels 98% on room air. And he weighs about 200 pounds. In regards to his physical examination, he generally appears anxious and tired. Um, no issues, basically what I'm saying is no issues in, involving his head or his neck, ear. So H-E-E-N-T is head, eyes, ears, nose, throat. So I didn't put all of the characteristics that I usually would put in the physical exam here. In the cardiovascular system, we note that the patient has regular heart sounds, normal heart sounds and no rhythm abnormalities, no murmurs either. RP stands for the radial pulse, and then you have the dorsalis pedis pulse. Um, so checking his pulses were normal on both sides. Um, in regards to the respiratory or lung exam, his lungs were clear. In regards to the GI or abdominal exam, um, his abdomen was non-tender, non-distended, bowel sounds present. Um, in regards to his skin exam, you can see that I've bolded the abnormal findings here. So he has darkly pigmented patches noted on the back of his neck, which is the posterior aspect and in bilateral underarms. Um, so, you know, sometimes just looking at the skin, you can learn a lot. So it's very important to note that you should do skin exams on patients. Um, neurologically, he's awake, alert, oriented. Um, so no issues there. Um, because he was having issues in regards to numbness and tingling, um, I did a monofilament foot exam, um, which is basically a fiber that you use and you kind of, you're essentially poking the person's foot and you're seeing if they're able to feel the spots. So the, the patient actually had decreased sensation in five different sites along the bottom of his feet. So what do we do next? So I actually want to go back here, but basically um, just wanted to see here. Yeah. So what would we do next at this point? Um, 
couple of things that come to mind before I go to the next page, but basically I'm concerned about diabetes in him. He has very classic characteristics, very classic signs. He has the family history. You know, he, he's 200 pounds, his blood pressure is elevated. He has these darkly pigmented patches that, um, you know, you can actually see in patients that are diabetic. And it's a finding that's called acanthosis nigricans, okay? Um, and then obviously we are finding neuropathy in his feet, which means decreased sensation in his feet. So if you move on to the next uh, slide, let me see if I can get to the next slide here. So labs that I would order would include a comprehensive metabolic panel. And so that would include a glucose, it would include the kidney function, liver function, electrolytes like sodium potassium. Um, additionally, I would order a hemoglobin A1C, which is utilized in diagnosing diabetes. I'd also look for, look at his urine, so get a urinalysis. And then I would also check a complete blood cell count because he mentioned feeling tired all the time. So I'm a little concerned, is he anemic? So um, I didn't list all of the labs. Here are some pertinent ones. So his creatinine, which is part of his kidney function panel is slightly abnormal. So what this tells me is he may be a little dehydrated. If you think about it, he mentioned he's urinating very frequently. So it could be impacting or affecting his kidney function. His glucose level is extremely high. And what I did not note here is that the blood work was done um, when he was not fasting um, and his glucose is 300. Uh, his hemoglobin A1C came back at 11.5%. And his urine showed glucose, so he's filling urine, um, glucose into his urine. He has some proteins there, which again shows me that he has a little bit of kidney damage and ketones. And when you see ketones in urine, it's generally a sign of dehydration. So it matches with the creatinine that I talked about a little earlier. I also, like I said, checked a complete blood cell count to ensure that we weren't missing any sign of anemia and his hemoglobin was normal. So what is the diagnosis? We have type one diabetes. So I, I'm going to go in and talk about diabetes a little bit and give a little bit of background and information. And if you guys have questions about the case or anything, feel free to go ahead and ask. I'm going to try to pull up the chat box again if I can. Oh, what just happened? Yeah, so um, I got asked this question, would you also do a glucose tolerance test? And so I'm going to go into how you diagnose diabetes in just a second and kind of tell you about that. Okay, so talking about, speaking about type 2 diabetes, um, in the U.S., more than 34 million Americans have diabetes. That's one in 10 people. That is a large number. Approximately 90 to 95 percent have type 2 diabetes. The remainder have type 1 diabetes. Most often, type 2 diabetes develops over the age of 45. Unfortunately, we are seeing um, this change a little bit, and we're seeing younger and younger patients also develop type 2 diabetes. Um, common symptoms, and we've talked about that in the case, include polydipsia, polyphagia, and polyuria. Um, polydipsia is excessive thirst, polyphagia is excessive hunger, and polyuria is excessive urination. So we call these the three Ps. Um, visual disturbances, so you could have some blurred vision, neuropathy, this patient was experiencing some numbness and tingling in his feet, and his monofilament exam also kind of um, confirms that for us. Um, you can feel generally fatigued. You may have some vague abdominal discomfort, don't have to. It's just another one of the symptoms that I've seen. Um, in regards to diagnosis, so basically um, hemoglobin A1C is um, primarily utilized by clinicians and an A1C of 6.5% or higher is generally used and, di and that's diagnostic. Um, so in our patient, his A1C was over 11. It was 11.5. So he definitely has diabetes. Um, you could, otherwise you could use a fasting plasma glucose level of 126 or higher. Remember our patient was not fasting and his number was over or a random, it was a random glucose and it was over 200, which is the next criteria. So you could do a random plasma glucose of 200 or higher and his was 300. 
or you can do the two hour plasma glucose level of 200 or higher during a 75 gram oral glucose tolerance test. So yes, um, the question I got asked here was, would you also do a glucose tolerance test? You don't have to do a glucose tolerance test. It is one of the ways you can diagnose. Um, I will tell you that uh, family physicians don't often use it. Um, we find doing an A1C is a lot easier and a lot faster, more convenient for patients. Um, and a lot of times we even have the rapid point of care tests in our, in our um, clinic. So we can actually diagnose a patient with diabetes right there in the office before letting them go. Um, and this is generally what I would do. Um, the glucose tolerance test is most often used um, in pregnant women. Um, and what is the difference? Here's another question. What is the difference between type one and type two diabetes? Great question. So type one and type two diabetes. So type two diabetes means that you have some resistance to insulin, um, meaning like you have insulin that's produced in your body, which is a hormone that helps manage or maintain your glucose levels. And unfortunately, your cells or the receptors on your cells that generally, generally respond to insulin are not responding as well to insulin. So when you have that um, decreased sensitivity to insulin, then your sugar levels or glucose starts to go up. Um, and I'll talk about treatment in the next slide. Type 1 diabetes is essentially just you're not even producing insulin. So it's a total insulin or mo mostly total insulin deficiency. So whereas in type 2 diabetes, you may be able to manage patients with oral medications. In type 1 diabetes, the patient has to be on insulin. Another question that, th that I'm seeing is, why is there such a large amount of type 2 diabetes compared to type 1? Um, good question. I don't think I have a complete answer for you. Um, but type 2 diabetes oftentimes is occurring in patients that are overweight or obese. And as we know, obesity is a big problem in our country. Um, and that kind of goes back to my point when I was talking about the statistics, is that we're actually seeing type 2 diabetes in younger and younger uh, in the younger and younger population because we're seeing younger and younger folks developing obesity. So hopefully that helps a little bit with that. I'm gonna move on to the next slide here. If it allows me to. Okay, so it's not. Okay, let's see if I can present from here. Okay, so I was just talking on about treatment options. So there are oral medication options. There's also insulin therapy for type two, and there's other injectable treatment options as well that can be utilized. Additionally, you know, I'm looking at it from a full body perspective, you have to not just treat the diabetes, you have to look at taking care of other aspects of the patient's health. So make sure the patient's blood pressure is under control, make sure that their cholesterol or lipid levels are under control. Um, check on preventive measures. Are they eating a healthy diet? Probably not. So you wanna talk about the diet, dietary modification, um, physical activity, um, work, you know, advise them to work on improving that. Uh, make sure they're up to date on their vaccinations. Um, patients that have diabetes are at higher risk of developing infections. So for example, making sure they have their pneumonia vaccines, making sure they're getting their annual flu shots, all of that's really important. Another thing I wanted to mention is smoking cessation. Obviously, we know that tobacco use is a risk factor um, for a lot of different conditions, including diabetes. So working on smoking cessation is important as well. In regards to referrals, I would say um, patients with diabetes need to have a biennial retinal exam. So that happens through an ophthalmologist. Um, you know, if they're having really bad neuropathy um, and for some reason, if you don't feel it's primary care that you're able to manage it, you can send them to podiatry. A lot of times you send to pod podiatry if they have ulcers that need to be managed because a lot of patients with diabetes can develop ulcers. Um, 
if they have uncontrolled diabetes. Um, and then nephrology, so the kidney specialists, because another risk uh, of complication could be development of um, kidney failure. So, you know, some of these patients end up on dialysis. Um, so another important, important point to note. And I'm gonna see if I can keep having this issue and I wanna make sure I get through all these cases for you guys. So give me just a second. Yes. Okay. So second case, a um, little bit longer description. Mrs. B is a 32-year-old Caucasian female who presents to the clinic with decreased energy, sleep disturbances, and mood changes. She has a six-month-old healthy baby girl. She states that after the birth of her child, she started feeling sad, overwhelmed, and was consistently tearful. She also frequently felt irritable and on edge. She struggled with breastfeeding and switched to bottle feeding, and as a result, she felt like she was a failure as a mother. Her husband tried to support her the best he could, but also felt overwhelmed by it all. She had thought that she could return to wearing her pre-pregnancy clothes after childbirth, um, but found that she was struggling to lose weight, leading her to feel ashamed with her own appearance. As a result, she often turned to snacking on junk food in order to comfort herself. Additionally, she developed difficulty sleeping. As a mother to an infant, she was already waking up several times a night to feed her baby, but over time, she found that even when her daughter was asleep, she struggled to get rest. She said she is tired of feeling this way. In terms of her past medical history, she has a history of depression and anxiety. No surgeries, no social history. She's married and in a monogamous relationship with her husband. Um, there's family history of depression in her mother. She has no known medication allergies. And she's not currently on any medications, but prior to her pregnancy, she was taking Zoloft um, for her depression. So uh, I'm going to run through this real quick, but her vitals were all stable. On appearance, she appeared sad, um, teary-eyed, wasn't making much eye contact. Most of her exam was normal otherwise, but she did appear depressed and anxious. So what do you do next? So um, basically what I would utilize is a patient health questionnaire. Um, there are different ones. There's two and there's nine. So generally you start with two. Um, I would order some labs to rule out some underlying medical conditions that could be causing the depression, including checking on her thyroid function and checking her complete blood cell count. So let's talk about the patient health questionnaire. It's also known as the PHQ. Basically, this is an example of one that's most very commonly utilized. But if you run through this questionnaire, um, the questionnaire is something that you give and you ask the patient over the last two weeks, how often have you been bothered by any of the following problems? And so if you look at the categories, it says, you know, not at all, several days, which is generally one to three days, more than half the days, so four, maybe five days, and nearly every day to six to seven days a week. Um, and so the questions you ask are, do you have little interest or pleasure in doing things? Are you feeling down, depressed, or hopeless? Are you having trouble falling or staying asleep or sleeping too much? Are you feeling tired or having little energy? Are you having a poor appetite or overeating? Are you feeling bad about yourself? Um, are you having trouble concentrating on things such as reading? Um, are you moving or speaking so slowly that other people could may have noticed? Or the opposite where you feel very fidgety uh, or restless? And most importantly here is, do you have any thoughts that you'd be better off dead or of hurting yourself? Additionally, when it comes to um, women, you know, after they've given birth, you also wanna assess safety of the child. Um, make sure the mother is not having any thoughts of hurt, hurting her child. Um, there is a scoring system that's at the bottom right. I'm not sure if you can see that, but basically um, categorizes a breakdown of the scores and you know what severity level of depression that they have according to that. Um, based on this and the case that I presented, I would say that um, our patient likely had moderate to moderately severe depression. Um, 
And so really what she has as a diagnosis is postpartum depression. So why am I talking about postpartum depression as a family medicine physician? The reason is that it is a very common condition. And, um, you know, while a mother is pregnant, she's seeing her OB regularly for visits. And then she does a six week postpartum visit. And then that's it with her OB. After that, you know, they should be coming back to primary care. But oftentimes I've found that, you know, families are so busy with their newborns that they may not be prioritizing their own health. It's very natural. So it's really important um, diagnosis to think about. Um, in terms of statistics, approximately 70 to 80% of women experience baby blues, which generally occur and resolve in the first, within the first few weeks of the baby being born. But approximately 10 to 20% of women develop postpartum depression. Based on the data I was finding, that's about one in seven women. That's very, that's obviously very common. I've seen some studies that say one in five, one in six. Um, you know, long story short, it's very common. Um, and it's often missed, which is not good. Um, this really equates to about 600,000 new diagnoses of postpartum depression among women annually. And that's not even including the number of women that you know, may also have depression um, and they've had miscarriages or stillbirths. That adds up another 300,000 new diagnoses for a total of 900,000. Additionally, a lot of times we don't think about it, but 50% of men who have partners with postpartum depression also develop depression. So it's something that really needs to be considered and recognized. So there are different treatment modalities when it comes to depression in general, not just postpartum depression. Um, therapy and counseling are one. Antidepressant medications. Um, in that patient's case, she had a history of depression, which already put her at much higher risk of developing postpartum depression. Um, she was on Zoloft, which is probably the most studied antidepressant when it comes to um, women that are pregnant and women that are breastfeeding. In our patient's situation, she had stopped trying to breastfeed. She was bottle feeding, so we won't have to be as concerned about the safety uh, um, around starting her on an antidepressant. Um, a key question to ask patients who have been on medication or antidepressants in the past is, what have you taken in the past for your depression and if it worked? Because if it worked, it's likely something you can try again for the patient, um, get them back on it. Um, treat any underlying medical con conditions. So like I mentioned for that patient, I would have checked a thyroid function panel and a complete blood cell count. And I would have treated any of the conditions that arose um, depending on the lab results. Um, other things that can help with depression and your mood, you know, healthy diet, healthy eating, physical e exercise or activity, um, meditation. And if it was something that, you know, I felt that I couldn't, you know, manage or I wasn't finding a medication that worked for the patient, then you talk about referral to psychiatry. So let's see. I have several questions about this. Um, are women with past medical history of depression and anxiety more likely to develop postpartum depression? Yes, unfortunately, um, they are at higher risk. I don't have the full stats off the top of my head, but um, they are on postpartumdepression.org, which is one of the resources that I utilize for the statistics. So you feel free to take a look there. Um, how do you know if an individual is 100% honest on the PHQ or if they are manipulating their answers in a socially acceptable manner? That's a great question. There are definitely times where I've seen patients, you know, circle zero, and then I'll sit down with them and you can tell sometimes by body language that someone is going through something that they may not have discussed. Um, and so oftentimes I, in those situations, I would try to bring it up. Were you, you know, 100% truthful on this? Is there anything that you need to talk about with me? I'm concerned about you. I want to make sure you're okay. How can I help you? So there are different questions you can ask. Sometimes it's a matter of building trust. Well, actually a lot of times it's a matter of building trust with your patients. Um, not everyone is gonna be truthful. Not everyone is gonna honestly say what they are going through. Another thing I didn't mention here is screening for domestic violence and abuse. Are they depressed because they're being harmed in any way? Um, so definitely things to think about. How does taking antidepressants affect breastfeeding? So the antidepressants don't actually affect um, milk production, but there's concern that 
you know, the antidepressants can be transmitted to babies through breastfeeding because maybe some of it will be in the breast milk. So because it's not fully studied, um, not all antidepressants have been studied, you have to, you know, you have to make sure that women are aware in that situation and, and honestly have a discussion with them if it's something that they want to do. Sometimes, you know, that's why Zoloft is probably the best because it's the most studied um, to utilize in such instances. So for this patient that we just talked about, I would definitely utilize it. Um, is postpartum depression more common if it's the patient's first child or subsequent births as well? Great question. Um, I don't know exactly the statistics about this. Um, so I couldn't give you, I couldn't give you a clear answer on it. It's definitely a good question though. Um, what I've read is there's definitely a high risk with the first child. Um, but I don't know if it's going to be higher with subsequent births. So great question. All right, let's see if this lets me do this because every time I open the chat box. Okay, there we go. <laughs> um, all right, so let's talk about the final case. And if there are any other questions, you know, we'll address them at the end. I apologize if I've missed any. I just want to make sure I get through this with you guys. Okay, third and final case. Um, Miss C is a 26 year old Caucasian female who presents to the clinic for her annual physical examination. She has no current complaints. She has not been seen by a primary care physician in several years. So she now wants to get established with a PCP, which is a primary care physician and start taking care of her health. Past medical history is done, no surgical history. She occasionally drinks alcohol. She is currently sexually active in a relationship with her boyfriend for the past five months and has had two sexual partners total, including her boyfriend as one of them in the past 12 months. Family history, breast cancer in her mom's mom or maternal grandmother. Um, and she has an allergy to penicillin, reaction is hives. And medication, she's on none. So I just wanna stop here real quick because there are a couple of key things I wanna talk about. One is, one thing that often gets missed when we talk to patients is sexual history. It's something that you know physicians aren't always comfortable addressing, but I just wanna make it clear, it should really be standard when you see any patient. It shouldn't be necessarily specific to one patient. If you saw in the last two cases as well, I also mentioned sexual history um, because there are conditions that we you know, often forget or overlooked. You know, I've talked about um, how I do care for patients with HIV, and it's really important to understand that. Um, the other thing I want you to note is in regards to allergies. There are many patients that may say they're allergic to X, Y, and Z. It's really important to know what their reaction is to the medication. I've had situations where patients say they're allergic to essentially every antibiotic in existence, and they come in for an infection that needs to be treated. What do you give them? Are you going to send them to the hospital for IV antibiotics or are you going to ask them more questions? I think you start with asking more questions. What is your allergy to this medicine? What is your allergy to this medicine? And when I say that, I'm saying, what is your reaction? And you'll find a lot of these cases are, it upset my stomach. That is not an allergy. That is a side effect to the medication. It's very important to educate patients on this. So in this case, the patient had a true allergy. That is hives. Um, so I just wanted to make sure I noted that. Um, so what do we do next in this situation? So she's here for a physical. Uh, part of your job as a family physician is to understand at what age you do what screenings for a patient. So one thing obviously is making sure patients up to date on vaccinations. She's a young, healthy woman. She doesn't have past medical history. So technically you don't have to do any blood work. You can though, you could do some basic labs if you'd like to, or if the patient is like, I just wanna make sure I'm not anemic. Great, so do a complete blood cell count, do a comprehensive metabolic panel. We talked about those earlier. Uh, beyond that, some, some patients need a lipid panel, for example, for employment purposes. So you could do that as well if you needed to, but otherwise I wouldn't necessarily think to do that. So you're doing a full physical examination. Let's talk about screenings. So in her instance, she's 26, she's been out of care for a while. She needs cervical cancer screening. Uh, we start that at the age of 21. Um, and so she's five years overdue on that. So one thing that's not listed here is, you know, and you should ask these questions as well, especially for women and obviously women, women in reproductive age group is when their last menstrual period was just a standard question that generally gets asked. 
Um, I just happened to not mention it in this case. Now, in regards to her exam, overall, everything was normal. The main thing I'm pointing out here is the GU exam. She had normal external genitalia, slight cervical erythema that was noted, no cervical lesions were noted, no abnormal vaginal discharge, did a bimanual exam and noticed no cervical motion tenderness. Now, if she had cervical motion tenderness, and this is a side note, um, we get concerned about an STI, sexually transmitted infection, such as chlamydia. And women can present with no symptoms, so it's important to note. So the other thing which I didn't mention in regards to screenings and labs are things that we need to be more aware of as primary care physicians, and that is screening for HIV and screening for STIs. So uh, for women, you're going to, and women and men, you should be offering STI screening and HIV screening. With HIV screening, it's I think called an opt out, opt out test, meaning patients can decide if they want the test or not. HIV is a blood test. Um, with STI screening, say for gonorrhea and chlamydia, generally a simple urine test. But if you're performing a pap smear, which is what I've described in the GU exam for this patient, um, you can actually add on the gonorrhea chlamydia test to the pap. So, um, and pap smears are to look for a cervical cancer. So we just talked about this. Um, we performed cervical cancer screening, ordered labs, the patient agreed to HIV screening, STI screening, which came back negative, and then making sure she's up to date on her immunizations. Um, pertinent results, her pap smear pathology came back about a week later, and it showed a low-grade intraepithelial lesion, also known as LSIL. So let me see if I can pull the chat box real quick. I don't see any questions just yet. So this is a patient who didn't have any family history of cervical you know, abnormalities that we're aware of. Um, and now she has a low-grade intraepithelial lesion. Again, why am I talking about something that gynecology should be seeing? It's because as family medicine, you may see this too, okay? Um, so it's important to note these things that you know, family medicine is truly a very diverse field. And again, my thing won't let me scroll, so I'm gonna come down here while I'm running out of time. So I won't get into the guidelines because I'm almost out of time. I apologize, you guys, but there are guidelines you can find on the ACOG website. For this patient, she needed a colposcopy, which is the biopsy of her cervix that you would have to do. Um, and uh, based on that, you determine next steps. And colposcopies are actually things that you can do as a family medicine physician. Um, after that, if it's something truly, you know, worse than that, or a, a really highly abnormal where you're worried about cancer, then you do refer to gynecology or gynonc. In terms of treatment, you do surgery, chemotherapy, or radiation. Cervical cancer is not as common these days, but still the estimates show based on American Cancer Society that there are approximately 13,800 new cases of invasive cervical cancer this year and 42,000, almost 43,000 or 4,300, I'm sorry, deaths due to cervical cancer. Um, and it's preventable. There is a vaccine that can prevent it. I don't have time to go through um, much more, but I'm going to just go ahead and see, you know, if you guys have questions. I did have some pre-med tips I wanted to share, but unfortunately, I look like I'm going to be out of time. So let me see what questions you guys have for me. Is it common for family physicians to do pap smears over gynecology? Um, I don't think it's like one way or the other. I think it's both. So gynecology, yes, absolutely. Obviously, they do that all the time. And some family, um, and it's not 100% family physicians that do it. It's really based on preference. I always do pap smears. That is part of my practice. Um, and it saves patients, you know, a referral elsewhere, and they can get that done in one location. Um, what if she's not sexually active? Does she still need a pap smear? Yes, the guidelines, and unfortunately, I wasn't able to review them, is starting at the age of 21, you start pap smears. You do not have to be sexually active. Uh, between the ages of 21 and 29, they're every three years. And 30 and over, well, 30 to 65, it's every five years with uh, HPV co-testing. 
Um, would you also do genetic testing for the breast cancer? It's generally when you have two or more family members, immediate family members that have breast cancer that you do genetic testing. So in her case, I would not do it. Um, what is your top tip for pre-meds? Ooh, I have so many. <laughs> so I don't know if I have one. Um, let me see if I can run through that because I really did want to share that with you guys. Oh. Sorry guys, I'm just not very tech savvy. So in terms of classes, I do wanna say that you do not have to be majoring in a science field to be pre-med. And the reason I say this is there's so much you can learn in college. Um, so you can be a Spanish major and be pre-med. Um, it will make you stand out because you have a different degree that you can utilize later. For example, when you have patients that speak Spanish, you will hopefully be fluent and be able to communicate with, with them well. To be pre-med, all you have to do is complete the pre-med requirement classes. Um, one tip I would have in regards to classes is talk to previous students about the level of difficulty of future classes you're going to take so you can kind of plan ahead. Um, if the class is known to be difficult, get a tutor. Don't be afraid to do that. Utilize the resources you have at school and join a study group if you have to. One other thing I would do in regards to classes is balance your classes. So really plan your schedule ahead of time. Um, you know, maybe one semester take one hard class and then two easy classes to balance it out. You don't wanna get burnt out. In regards to extracurriculars, shadow a physician, which you guys are already doing. But additionally, uh, med schools wanna see that you're doing research and if you can get your name published, great. Um, volunteer in different organizations I've listed. In regards to MCAT, I mean, I have general advice regarding studying for any standardized test and it's don't use too many resources because they will get confusing and you'll get overwhelmed. Um, focus on one or two main resources and do practice questions, do them over and over again. If you've gone through all the questions in your question bank once, do it all over again. That is truly a way to study um, for these tests. Oh, I'm so sorry, just doing this. Okay. And then really, I want you guys to ask yourselves, why do you wanna go into medicine? Is it to make someone else happy? Is it to make you happy? You want to find happiness in what you do in your life. So really, I want you to be happy in medicine and you know, to know if you're going to be, you have to shadow physicians, learn about different specialties because you'll never know which one. Um, it will also teach you about different specialties and help you decide which one you're truly interested for the future. Plan ahead, plan ahead, plan ahead. You know, organization is key. Things may change over time for you, but at least you have a structure to work off of. When you are studying or taking your classes, focus on your goal and don't get distracted with other things during that time. It's so easy to pick up your phone, jump on social media. The time you dedicate to studying should just be used for studying purposes. Even if it's one hour and then you leave and you do something else, definitely take breaks in between. But during that one hour, focus 100% on what you're doing. Take care of yourselves. It's so easy and so common to get burnt out in medicine and in undergrad when you're pre-med. So really do take care of yourselves and don't give up. Medicine is achievable, you know, you can definitely do it. Um, you know, I've struggled, I'll be honest. I know so many of my colleagues that struggled through undergrad, med school, residency, but you know, they kept fighting and they were able to accomplish their dreams and goals. So you're not alone in this, you know, we all go through it and I believe in you guys, okay? I know I'm ending on a cheesy note, <laughs> but um, hopefully, hopefully those words help you guys. Um, and, you know, if you have further questions, feel free to reach out and ask me. Here's my email address. You can follow me on Instagram. I share, you know, tips on there as well. Um, right now, the residency match is going on. So I've been posting a lot about that. But, you know, feel free to um, follow me there. Let me see if I can pull the chat box again. Thank okay, you so, so questions? much. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Varma. That was a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with this, yeah. speak about this with us. 
Absolutely. Um, Thanks for, for everyone um, watching the live stream. Um, the Google Doc, um, the Google form has been posted in the chat box. So if you want to fill that out for your attendance verification, that would be great. And we'll leave that open for another 30 minutes. Um, thank you so much, everyone. And thank you again, Dr. Varma.